Hi there, this is John Wilkinson from History Made Easier with another German Depth Study presentation to help with your revision. This time looking at six key factors to the Nazis' control of Germany and providing you, I hope, with a lot to think about. Control of what or who, I title this slide. It might be absolutely appropriate for you to refer to Germans or Germany in answering a question. But it might be necessary, and if not necessary, then it might be beneficial for you to identify just who the Nazis were trying to control more carefully. Was it the elites, for example, or workers, or radicals in their own party, or was it the army? You may remember me saying in another presentation about leading the examiner by the hand through your answers. Try to make clear to the examiner just who you are referring to at different points in your answer. Give this some thought as you revise your topic and it'll be easier on the day. Then there is the matter of the degree of control. You might mean controlling their behaviour or more difficult to achieve, their thinking. Or it might just have been a case of keeping people compliant. And a question that you might well face is, was Nazi Germany a totalitarian state? Now, total control is, of course, impossible. But was there enough control in Nazi Germany to call it a totalitarian state, a totalitarian regime. It was a one-party state with an official ideology that didn't tolerate different views. It tolerated religion, but only as far as it had to. And Hitler's word was the last word. The civil service, the judiciary, the army were all placed under tight control and loyal party members were put in positions to see that they did, those institutions did what the government demanded. The media was also tightly controlled and the people were told only what the government wanted them to hear. There was no freedom, no alternative parties, no free trade unions, no rights to appeal against arbitrary or unfair decisions. There was an ever-present secret police and the courts were not independent either. Education and youth organisations were heavily controlled by the state, the economy too, and everyone's roles, what the state expected of them, was made very clear and enforced. Or am I exaggerating? You need to think about this and be clear about where you stand on the issue. And before you enter that exam hall. Now I've got two slides on the means, the means of asserting control. And in this first slide, I'm going to begin with something that can be easily overlooked. Hitler got a lot of things right and many of his policies were very popular with large numbers of Germans. They had, after all, voted for the Nazis in their millions. And in power, Hitler was even more popular. He had given the unemployed jobs as he had promised to do. And the Olympic Games had made Germans proud. And what he was doing to the hated Treaty of Versailles was very popular. Germans felt that their country was a great power again after the humiliations of the First World War and the Treaty of Versailles. Then, when Germany defeated France, Hitler became the most popular politician amongst his own people 
on the planet. Many Germans who hadn't voted for the Nazis, but whose lives had been improved, accepted the regime. They were prepared to tolerate the loss of political freedom and ignore the terror so long as it didn't affect them. In return for work, foreign policy success and a strong government. Make a note of some of the things the Nazis did to benefit different groups so that you have some examples. <laughs> it makes it seem as if propaganda would hardly be needed. But it was. The Nazis th certainly thought so. All governments employ spin, as we call it today. They try to spin news as best as they can. They try to spin their message whenever they can. I've just done that on behalf of the Nazis. <laughs> but of course, there was another side to the story, and a majority of Germans, those who had voted for the Communist and Socialist parties, and also the Centre Party, would need to be convinced. But convinced of what? What was the Nazi message? To really understand Nazi Germany, it's important to understand that the Nazis did not set out to merely control the German people. They aimed to convert them into true believers, sharing the same values and ideas as the Nazis. Things such as racial purity, national solidarity and militarism, and with it the psychological preparation for war as well as total faith in Hitler as their leader. And Hitler was very clear about how propaganda should work. A very few simple points encapsulated in a simple catchy slogan and repeated over and over again, suggesting a low opinion of the intelligence of the average German. But of course, the Nazis also used oppression to enforce their control. Much as they had by far the largest vote in elections to the Reichstag, as I've said, the majority of Germans still hadn't voted for them. And as I've already said, they wanted to convert the German people into true believers. And so counter views had to be oppressed. This would be done by controlling their own message and denying a voice for alternative views. And this is something in which your topics overlap because the process began with Gleicheltung and the Nazis' consolidation of power. And you will see more of it when we come to look at the means by which the Nazi control was enforced. As for fear and terror, there is something very important about terror. It is not the victims of terror who are terrorized. Though they're beaten, tortured or murdered, it is the rest of the population who are terrorized, living in fear that they might be next. And so, coward, they conform. Consider the fact that the Gestapo relied so heavily on informers and often received more information than they could cope with. It's also important to note that fear or terror target... Uh, sorry, that fear or... Sorry, I, mean, I was on the right track. I'll start again. It's also important, and it is an important thing to note, so let's get this right that fear or terror targeted different people than propaganda. Propaganda works on those who are susceptible to it, those who are already leaning towards your way of thinking. Terror targeted those who weren't. Terror was for the communists and the socialists. Yeah? Sorry I got that a bit muddled up to begin with, but it was an important point to make clear. 
So, my second slide on the means. In studying Nazi propaganda and their use of culture and the mass media, you need to think of a mixture of how they made sure their message reached the people, for example, the people's radio, and how it was presented. In other words, the kind of language used and how censorship was used to make sure other messages were blocked. And you need to do this across the media, notably newspapers and radio, and how culture was used, be it literature, the cinema or whatever, and the way rallies and even the Olympics should be seen as propaganda. Joseph Goebbels was Minister of Propaganda and National Enlightenment. And think about that title. What was meant by Enlightenment? And you should be able to assess his significance and have a pretty good understanding of, of how his ministry was organised. And if you get the opportunity in a question, make a reference to the ever-present nature of the party, be it their posters, portraits of Hitler, swastika flags or the parades, the rallies, and the party-related holidays, or the Heil Hitler greeting and the block warden. The party seemed to be everywhere. But in thinking about propaganda, you also need to be clear about the difficulty in measuring its success. As I've said, at the peak of his powers, Hitler was almost surely the most popular, most loved politician amongst his own people on the planet. Do be clear about why this was so. What leads you to think that was so? However, the degree to which people were converted to Nazism was probably only minimal, though it did enough to keep people compliant. Studies of propaganda conclude that whilst it's quite successful in reinforcing already held views and maybe persuading people who were already beginning to come around to your way of thinking, and I've touched on this already, it's far less successful in converting doubters and decidedly unsuccessful in converting those who are already hostile to your way of thinking. Hence the need for terror. And after the fall of the Third Reich, Germans quickly reverted to the values of liberal democracy. So again, how successful was the propaganda? Whilst as far as compliance is concerned, it's difficult to tease out the different impact of propaganda from fear. I think I would use the two groups of different groups of people that they were targeting. Now, Propaganda was never going to do the job alone. I think I've been pointing that out. And there was also the SSSD Gestapo. The SS was many things, but in this context, it oversaw all matters regarding security. The SD focused on intelligence gathering, whilst the Gestapo's role was to search out opponents of the Nazi government, eliminate opposition, and deal with groups that the Nazis directly opposed. And there were the block wardens. Don't underestimate their importance, nor the importance of informers. Everyone was encouraged to report anti-Nazi talk, and certainly anti-Nazi activities. There were informers in the workplace. People were encouraged to report on their neighbours. Husbands were even encouraged to report on their wives and vice versa. Children on their parents or their teachers. As for the courts, 
the judiciary was brought under Nazi control when judges were required to join the National Socialist League for the maintenance of law and take an oath of loyalty to Hitler. In 1934, a new People's Court was established. It tried all cases of treason. Judges whose loyalty to the Nazi movement was not in doubt were selected for the new court. The penal system was bent to serve Nazi needs too. Concentration camps were quickly set up to deal with the expected numbers of communists, socialists, trade unionists, and churchmen and Jews. Don't forget the courts. They were a critical part of the Nazis' means of ensuring control. In dealing with opponents of the regime, Hitler made clear that there was no need for judicial proceedings, investigation and trial. The judgment of the Gestapo or the SS was sufficient for both proof of guilt as well as decisions regarding punishment. He wanted a ruthless organization totally dedicated to the Nazi movement and unrestrained by law. And with the SS, SD, Gestapo, that's exactly what he got. If you were arrested, convicted and punished by the Gestapo or the SS as they were acting on behalf of Hitler and the national community, their actions, and so your arrest, conviction and punishment, was entirely justified. Nor did an existing law have to be broken for an arrest, conviction and punishment to take place. If a Nazi controlled court said you had done wrong, then you were guilty of doing wrong. Concentration camps were quickly set up to deal with the expected numbers of communists, socialists, trade unionists, churchmen and Jews as I've mentioned. It has been estimated that by 1939, the courts had sentenced over 200,000 people for political crimes, and in the life of Nazi Germany, something like 3 million people were held at one time or another in prisons or camps for some kind of political offence, though mostly only held for a short time, enough to inject a good dose of fear. However, many political prisoners, communists, socialists and trade unionists, were executed. So, what, what opposition was there? Despite everything, there was opposition in Nazi Germany. And you need to prepare for a question on the form opposition took and on its significance. There was in fact a range of opposition from grumbling and passive resistance to underground resistance and open opposition to attempts to assassinate Hitler. As to its significance, its threat to the Nazi regime there are two ways of looking at this. The extent to which it showed there was a lot of opposition, and here numbers are clearly important, and the threat to the regime. Here there are three things to consider. First, again the numbers involved. Clearly the more involved, the more indicative of deeply felt opposition so a greater threat to the Nazis, and so the more significant. Though you could also say that the Kreisau circle, though small in number, would have been a potential threat because of who they were. Secondly, whether the nature of the opposition would encourage more to join. I'm thinking, for example, of the White Rose Group, who were a more significant threat than, say, the Edelweiss pirates. And thirdly, the consequence of their actions. And clearly, 
the attempts to assassinate Hitler were the greatest threat. And that's where I'll leave this presentation, leaving an examination of the persecution of minorities for another day. So thanks for listening and good luck with your revision. Do check out my website too, History Made Easier. But I guess if you've listened to this presentation, I'll see you in the next one too. So for now, cheers.